our brain, more than anything else, loves familiarity. You may have heard the saying that familiarity breeds liking. Well, our brain is no exception to that. In fact, our brains love anything familiar because it takes less time and resources to process that information. And we ask a lot of our brains. Just coming from our eyeballs alone, we get about 10 million bits of information per second that in this case, the visual cortex on occipital lobes need to deal with. People have tried to calculate how much total information processing happens in the brain, and estimates range from somewhere between 100 billion and 10 quadrillion processes per second that's going up in our gray matter. It's little wonder that an organ that's no more than 2% of our total body mass index takes up 25% of our total calorie intake per day. To put that in perspective, if the rest of our body needed as many calories to run, we'd have to eat about 25,000 calories per day. That's about 10 times the average diet. So our brain is a hungry, power-working machine, and it needs to take all the mental shortcuts it can get. Familiarity is just one of those. For the brain, it takes more time and resources to process anything new. So if you're going to, for example, recognize a new face or think of a new idea, that takes a lot of brain power and actually physical calories, glucose being chewed up by the brain to process all that information. But whenever your brain comes up with new information, it stores it so that it doesn't have to reinvent the wheel twice. That's why when you recognize an older face or you think about an idea that you've thought a lot about before, it takes not near as much energy and time and resources for the brain to do that. That's one of the reasons why the brain prefers things that are familiar. And not only does the brain prefer it, but you end up preferring it as well. So lots of studies have shown that the more you see a face over time, the more you see a picture, the more you read text uh, in repetition, the more you actually start to garner positive attitudes toward it. We tend to use this feeling of familiarity as a cue that something is good, uh, positive, even trustworthy and believable. In fact, one of the studies that first looked at this was done by Hasher and colleagues in 1977, and they first gave participants a whole list of true or false facts. So some of these are true, such as that lithium is the lightest of all the metals on the periodic table, and some of them were false, like that World War II ended in 1946 instead of 1945. So in these cases, participants wrote down whether they thought each one was true or false, but they weren't given any feedback on whether or not they were correct. Then one week later, they came back into the lab and were given a whole batch of items that sometimes included old items they'd seen and sometimes new items. And what they found was that when a participant was reading a familiar, a repeated item, they were much more likely to say that it was true regardless of its actual truth. So if someone had read that World War II ended in 1946 in week one, if they got that same fact in week two, they were much more likely to uh, say that it was true or believable than if they'd never heard that before. So just the fact that the brain has heard it before, it's familiar, we kind of tune into that and heuristically go, well, this seems familiar, so it's probably right. Another thing we use this sense of familiarity for is to gauge how popular an opinion seems to be. One study that looked at this had people listen to focus groups that were talking about areas and politics in Virginia. And these were all Virginian participants themselves. So some of the things they would discuss were whether local areas of Virginia, for example, forest areas, should be developed and turned into commercial and residential areas or preserved for their environmental protection. So while they were listening to these focus groups discuss these ideas, what they didn't know is that everyone in the focus group was actually an actor, and they were reading off of a carefully crafted script. So this script made it so that each opinion was either said once, three times by three different actors, or three times by the same actor. Then afterward, participants were asked questions like, how popular do you think this opinion is for the whole state of Virginia? And what they found was that the more a statement was repeated, regardless of whether it was by three different people or by the same person, the opinion was seen as more popular. Amazingly, even when participants were reminded this statement was only said by one person three times, still their popularity ratings of that perception of that opinion went up compared to when it was only said once by one person. So it's definitely true that the, in a sense, squeaky wheel gets the grease, or the one who cries the loudest gets the most attention, because if we hear an opinion over and over and over again, even if it's only by one vocal person, we're likely to think that that opinion is more believable, more popular, maybe even more trustworthy. Another group of researchers even did a study where they said that someone was a known liar and that known liar would then feed the participant supposed facts that were probably mostly false, because again, this guy was said to be a liar. 
And then one week later, they tested the believability of these facts along with new facts. And they found even when the facts came from a noted liar, people were more likely to say they were true than things that they'd never heard before. This is because when we encode information, we usually forget how or when or where or by whom we learned that information. So for example, it's probably true that most of you guys know that the state capital of California is Sacramento, right? Hopefully you guys knew that. But I doubt most of you will know when or from who or how or where you learned that bit of information. You might say, well, it probably was at school, but do you remember the exact time you opened up your textbook or heard it from a teacher and learned that bit of information? We actually lose that type of what we call episodic or life event information when it comes to factual memory very quickly. So what happens is often when people encode new information, they might forget that it actually came from an untrustworthy source. Of course, the power of repeated statements is used all the time by TV execs, uh, ad agencies, politicians, for example, and all the better if they're memorable or catchy or rhyme. So for example, Obama's uh, mottos were all about change. So change I can believe in, change I hope for, all this sort of stuff. So that when people heard this statement over and over and over again, it seemed to get more believable with time. And of course, Obama's not the first one to do this. Uh, even presidents as far back as Abraham Lincoln were known for their mottos. So Abraham Lincoln had the motto, don't change horses midstream. And this was, of course, during the Civil War, when the whole message was that we got into the Civil War, so we should take it to its end. We shouldn't jump out midway, because then, of course, uh, bigger catastrophes might happen. So in this way, whenever politicians or just advertisements use the same motto over and over again, over time they become more believable, more trustworthy, they just seem more right. Meta-analyses of a bunch of these different studies show that simply hearing something before increases its believability about 15 to 25%. So even things that might seem crazy or unbelievable get more believable the more times you hear them. A great example of this, and something I often talk about with my students, is the myth that every year you eat about eight spiders in your sleep. So this is something when I ask students who's heard of this, nearly everyone in the class raises their hand, and when I ask who believes in it, it's usually about 50% of people who say, yeah, that seems about right. You know, who knows what's happening when I'm sleeping with my mouth open? Of course, when you think about this logically, why would a spider crawl into your mouth? For one thing, usually you're breathing, hopefully, and that's gonna disturb the spider. Often spiders don't even get out of their webs, much less do they have any interest in people unless you're crawling with bugs or something like that. So on the surface of it, it seems like kind of a ludicrous statement. But what makes it so believable is that everybody's heard it. Now the funny thing is, we know exactly where this myth came from because it was part of a social experiment. So in 1993, this writer for PC Professional Magazine, Lisa Holt, released this statement through a chain letter to all her friends and family because she wanted to show how quickly information can get disseminated and believed in through email chain letters. And lo and behold, just about five years to a decade later, a majority of Americans have heard this false, completely made up statement that every year you eat about eight spiders in your sleep. This example really goes to show you how if enough people hear of something, or if you hear it enough times from enough people, you start to go, wow, that, that fact that seemed crazy actually seems believable now. It must be true because well, I've heard it so many times before. So as we've seen, the human brain uses a sense of familiarity about information to judge a lot of things. The believability or truth of statements, also how much something is liked or enjoyed. We tend to like things that are familiar, that we've heard a lot before, and basically things that are easy for the brain to process. This is probably why when we look at different groups of media, TV, movies, books, we see that there actually isn't that much variety in what's popular, what sells the most. So for example, if you look in the past few years, the top grossing movies have continually been CGI heavy action fantasy movies, many of them now involving superheroes. The same thing now holds for popular music. If you listen to the top 40 songs, you're going to again and again come upon a song with an electronic, consistent beat, a heavy bass tone, and a mid-range vocal in a ballad style. Almost all music for the past three years, at least popular music, has followed this orientation. If you look at the top grossing books, you usually see that about 80% are either adult mystery novels or young adult fantasy novels, both involving a lot of action, or autobiographies or memoirs written by politicians or movie actors. Across the board, we see very little variety across different media groups, and that goes to show you that when people are looking for entertainment, what they're really looking for is a familiar experience. 
If aliens, for example, came down to Earth and saw our most popular media, they would say, wow, all these songs sound the same. All these movies have the same action beats, the same type of actors. All of these books cover the same content. Humans really must not like much variety. And the truth is that we don't. In general, what people are really drawn to in terms of entertainment or political beliefs, religious beliefs, is really just what's familiar. a very small part of a very large industry. Is it true? 